Well, thank you. Uh, it is an honor and a blessing to be here, and, and thank you for inviting me back home. I'd like to begin my talk today by asking you uh, a question. I, I already know the answer to this question, but I'll, but I'll ask it anyway. Have any of you ever received what you consider to be a, a sign from God that maybe there was something you needed to do or, or not do in your life? I'm sure most of us have had certain moments that we consider to be divinely directed. And I had one particularly significant moment happen like that for me 19, nine, about 19 years ago, 20 years ago now. It was 20 years ago that I received a sign from God that I really needed to live my life in a little bit different direction than I had been living it. And when I say sign from God, oh, I'm talking about an actual sign. It was words on a piece of paper stuck up on a wall in someone's office. But before I tell you what that sign said, let me tell you about another sign I saw. Another sign I saw that same year. And this sign was more of an indication and a summation of how I had been living my life up to that point. This sign was in a lobby of a hotel in California. I was out there in business, I was staying in this hotel, and the hotel was hosting a convention. Now, I was not part of that convention, but I could certainly identify with their theme. Because there in the lobby of that hotel, in a big sign, where the theme was the theme of this convention, and it was three words, and those words were, make it happen. Make it happen. You know, to me, those three words were way more than one company slogan for the week. To me, those three words were really the motto for my life. For I really believed at that point, if there was anything that I wanted to get out of life in particular, then it was up to me, and me alone, to make it happen, to force it into beingness. You know, the way I saw life at that time, I didn't think the world was out to do me any favors. Nothing came easy, nothing came for free. To put my faith in anyone or anything other than myself seemed totally foolish to me. No matter what the goal, the only way I thought you could achieve success was through three things. Hard work, determination, and above all, a high degree of personal control. <laughs> oh yeah, that worked like gangbusters. <laughs> I thought I had to be in control of my life, but nothing ever really seemed to be in my control. No matter how carefully I planned something or, or how hard I worked to make it happen, I was continually frustrated in my efforts to achieve the exact outcomes I desired. And even if I did force things to go pretty much the way I wanted them to go, that victory was hollow. Hard won and hardly worth the effort. Or worse, my triumph would set me up for a whole new set of problems. You know, rock life at that time really seemed to be one long uphill battle, and I felt like I was losing that battle. Nevertheless, I really didn't know any other way to live life at that point. So I continued to control, to manipulate, to push, to demand, to persuade, to claim, to strive, until finally, life got so difficult for me, I found myself in a therapist's office seeking some guidance. To tell you the absolute truth, I was really kind of drinking quite heavily at that point time just to, to medicate the constant feeling of anxiety and carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. Well, the good news is I did get the guidance I needed that day. But strangely enough, it wasn't in the therapist's office. It was in the waiting room. I was sitting in that waiting room, and I looked up on the wall, and there was a little bitty handwritten sign stuck on the wall with a piece of scotch tape, and it had five words on it. And those words were, let go and let God. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. You know, at that point, I had heard that, but I had no real clear meaning, understanding of what that really meant. It didn't seem to be even a complete sentence to me. Of let go, let go of what? I wasn't holding on to anything. And let God, let God what? Let God do something? I mean, really, what does God really do? Now, don't get me wrong, it, it wasn't that I didn't believe in, in a God at that time. I certainly believe there's some kind of divine power that set the whole universe in motion at the time of the Big Bang. But I wasn't all convinced about how involved that God had been since that point. Nothing my awareness, or really in my conscious awareness, had ever indicated to me that God could be or would be an active participant in my life. Nevertheless, as unsure as I was about God's activity in this world, I was certain about one thing. My way of living life wasn't working very well. Life seemed far too difficult. I was far too unhappy. 
and I was making my friends and family miserable as well. So I decided I would find out a little more about what does it really mean to let go and let God. And as I found that out, and as I began practicing letting go of just a little thing at a time, I couldn't believe the miracles that started happening in my life right that second. It seemed like the second I let go of the idea that everything had to go my way, everything did go my way. <laughs> Maybe not in the way that I planned <laughs> or the way that I expected, but certainly in a way that was to my benefit and to the benefit of all involved. You know, now, instead of it seeming like the world was working against me, it felt like the world was working for me. I experienced a whole lot more success with a whole lot less stress. I let go and I experienced what I like to call the miracle of the flow. This little book is based on one simple and single idea. And that idea is this, that there truly is an underlying current in our lives, a divine flow that is continually guiding us towards the effortless fulfillment of our heart's desires. Let me say that again. There is an underlying current in our lives, a divine flow, if you will, that is continually guiding us towards the effortless fulfillment of our heart's desires. The trick is just learning how to recognize and cooperate with that flow. Fortunately, that is really not a very difficult thing to learn how to do. Because you already know the set of instructions by heart. And those are, row, 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 your boat, gently, down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. That's opposed to the set of instructions I had been living my life by up to that point, which is, row, row, row your boat, madly, up the stream, worry, 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 life is a nightmare. <laughs> The original lyrics, not the revised version by me <laughs> and many others. <laughs> the original version actually was written in 1850. And what's interesting about that song, especially for the musicians here today, if you did not know, that is one of the few rounds that no one knows who wrote it or why. Most rounds come from England and everybody, it's published music, they know who wrote the lyrics, they know who wrote the music. But this one just sprang up in the middle of this country in about 1850, and nobody knows why or, or wherefore. In fact, it was 30 years before a single melody got situated with it. The one we sang today was, uh, didn't get published until 1880, 30 years after the lyrics had already been floating around. But, you know, it, it doesn't make any difference. Regardless of the origins of that song, regardless of what its actual intentions were, I, for one, have found it to be a profound metaphor for what I call living life in the divine flow. Every single word in that song represents a spiritual principle that you need to know if you want to live a life of greater happiness, satisfaction, and ease. Now, I can't possibly go into what all the words mean this morning. We'd be here a long, long time, and I'm probably going to hold you late as it is. But what I can do is go over one word in that song. I can pick one word out of it and use it to illustrate most of the principles that are important for living life in the divine flow. And that word is row. And I brought a little prop along to help me demonstrate what it means to row with the flow, or not. <coughs> Rowing. To row simply means the actions that you take and the decisions that you make to, to fulfill a particular desire. Your desire may be something that you want to own, it may be something that you want to, to be, it may be something you want to do, your desire may be an adventure you want to experience, or your desire could be as simple as the plan to meet someone for dinner. Or your desire could be a lot more personal. It could be a desire to heal a wounded relationship. It really doesn't make any difference what your desire is. What you do is you picture it as a destination down the stream. You're here, but you want to be there. So, you decide to do this, and you decide to do that, and you decide to do this to get there. That's rowing. But, just as there are three rows in row, row, row your boat, there are three general ways that people go about rowing. And that's what I'd like to demonstrate for you right now. Here's the first way of rowing. And this is the way I rowed for 35 years of my life. And still tend to row that way today unless my sweetie Carol girl takes her paddle and gives me a little swat. <laughs> it looks something like this. I'm here, and I want to be there. There's something I want to do, something I want to have, something I want to be. So I decided to do this. And I decided to do that, and 
Oops, I've run into a closed door. <laughs> no problem for me. I'll just run through the window. <laughs> and I decide to do this, and I, hey, there's somebody standing in my way. That's not a problem either. I'll just <laughs> knock them out of the way. Oh, it's a little late. So I'll be rolling faster and faster and harder and harder until I do it. And I got here against all odds, through perseverance, determination. I got exactly where I wanted to be. And this is just so, this is just so, <sighs> not very fulfilling. It's not all this souped up to be. I'm a little bored. Wish I was somewhere else now. Ooh, it looks like I uh, hurt somebody along the way. Sorry about that, fella. That's one way of growing through life. Manipulating, controlling, pushing, clinging, demanding, persuading, striving. And I don't recommend it. There's some serious downsides to rowing your way through life that way. And why would anybody row that way? A couple reasons, actually. I think one reason people force their way through lives is because it seems to work. Seems to work. I had a goal in mind. I got there, didn't I? I got exactly where I wanted to go. But what happened when I got there? Was I fulfilled? Not really. Did I injure some others along the way? Yes, I did. And what about the stress and strain on my emotional and mental well-being? And did that have any physical consequences? You bet it does. There are a lot of downsides of forcing your way through life. Which brings me to the second reason I think people do that. And I did it for so long. We're used to it. We're used to it. I can't speak for you, but I know the way I was raised was like, life is hard. It's supposed to be hard. It may be even a way of God's testing you. I don't know. But it's all up to you. And it's just expected to be difficult. So I believe a lot of us, with that mindset, are taking on more than we need to. Just a matter, of course, is we think that's just the way it's done. And we've all developed, or quite a few of us anyway, a very high tolerance for pain. You know what? We're not, look, we're, we're not experiencing a, a more effortless, easy life because most of us aren't even looking for it. We're just doing it the way we've always done it. So there's more reasons than that, but that's a couple reasons that people tend to force their ways through lives. That it seems to work, and, and we're used to doing it that way anyway. We don't even realize the downsides in our, in our health and our emotional well-being. We're, we're constantly in a state of, of tension and anxiety and don't even know that we're so used to it. Now, here's, a, here's another way of rolling through life. This is the exact opposite of that. And I don't have much experience in this area, but I've seen it, and it's, it's, I like this one. It looks something like this. I'm here, and I want to be there. There's something I want to do, something I want to have, something I want to be. So, I get my trusty boat, pick up my oars, look to the sky, and say, okay, God, bring it on. <laughs> I'm ready. Come on, hand it over. What's the problem? What's the holdup? <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to control anything or manipulate anything. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait for you to put it in my lap. Okay. I think you know what I'm getting at there. You know, I am all for visualization. I am all for affirmations. I am all for meditation. All those Asians <laughs> are, are very important parts of the manifestation <laughs> process. But after that, there's always a little action required. A little action on your part. One thing I've noticed is that the divine flow leads, it guides, it directs, it supports, but it does not live your life for you. To get where you want to go, you're going to have to row. <laughs> the trick is just rowing with the flow and rather than against it. And so what do I mean by rowing with the flow? Well, that simply means following, attuning yourself to, and taking action on the guidance we are continually receiving. I, for one, believe, and I have experienced, the fact that we are constantly being guided by the divine. <coughs> continually. There's three ma major ways that we get guidance on, a, on an ongoing basis. The most reliable, actually, and valuable source of guidance you have is your own intuition. Your own intuition. Your intuition is your spirit speaking to you. It is the wisdom of God that is within you. It is the wisdom of God that is you. And it really serves you well to find out for yourself, what does your intuition feel like? How does it communicate with you? Is it a voice, is it a thought, a dream? And begin to heed that and, and value that and make decisions based on that. Don't just ignore it. 
It's very, very important. The second way we get guidance from God is through the wisdom of others. The wisdom of others. You know, sometimes people are in our path and we don't even realize it, and they don't realize it. They're there to help guide us forward, to give us a little piece of information. Some information that they know because of their experience, or they, that pops into their head because they're open to it, and you may be resisting it. So heed what people say. It doesn't mean you have to jump off the cliff when they say, let's all jump off the cliff. It just means listen. You can make your own decision later. Just heed it. Just don't shut people down from the get-go. There's a book, there's a children's book by Neil Donald Walsh called uh, Little Soul and the Sun. And there's a phrase that appears in there twice, and I really like it. It says, I have sent you nothing but angels. If you look at people as angels in your path to lead you forward, you'll get some great guidance from them. They'll be free for their in intuitive selves to, to bring forward, forth this message for you. If you're attacking them and criticizing them and blaming them and judging them, you think they're going to have some good, good information for you? No. They'll, they'll actually just retreat to their ego minds, and they'll be in an attack defense mode like you are. Nothing good will come of that. So two ways that we receive guidance. One, your own intuition. One, the wisdom of others. Which is actually their intuitive guidance being brought forth to help you. And the third way, signs, synchronicities, and coincidences. I think, I don't need to go into that. I think we've all been quite aware for a number of years how important these synchronistic coincidences are, that they are not mere chance. They are not mere happenstance. They are in our lives for a reason. And if you look at those and say, why did I experience this three times in this one day or three times in this week? You can find the message there. You can find the next right step you're supposed to take by paying attention to that. So, if you do that, if you pay attention to your intuition, if you pay attention to the wisdom of others, if you pay attention to the signs, the coincidences, and the synchronicities, you'll be rolling with the flow if you act on those things. And this is what it will look like. I'm here, but I want to be there. There's something I want to have, something I want to do, something I want to be. So, I decided to do this, and I decided to do this, and you know I have an intuitive feeling to call someone I haven't talked to in a long time, <laughs> and, I, and I talk to them, and hey, they have an interesting little piece of information for me. I don't know even what I think about that. And then later in the day, I experience that same information in a whole other way. I say, well, that's a coincidence, and hey, here I am. That was easy. That was effortless. Not straight or direct, but <laughs> you know, that's one thing about the flow. It is easy, it is effortless, because steps you get are small, tiny, little baby steps. It's just look in that shop window, call this person. It isn't giant things that you have to do. There's little things, one after another. But it can be a very circuitous, that's a big word, route. <laughs> and the reason for that, well, there's, a, there's lots of reasons for that, too. Here's a couple. One, the divine flow is guiding you around obstacles you would ordinarily run into had you just kept rolling straight ahead of your own thought process, your own willpower. So it's making things easier for you and you don't even realize it is. The second reason the, the route can be a little windy is because it's working things out in a way that's best for all concerned. For all concerned, not just you. you know, your good will never come at the expense of another's. And to make everything work out for everybody, and to get all the ducks in a row, so to speak, can be a, an overwhelming task for you, but not for God not for the divine. All things are possible with God. So trust that this flow is moving you in unusual ways so it's best for all concerned. And so you have an effortless, less stressful way of achieving your heart's desires. Now, what I just showed you is a little bit simplistic because I got exactly where I wanted to go, didn't I? And that, work, that happens. I've got lots of examples of me getting exactly where I wanted to go in no time at all, effortlessly. But it doesn't always work that way. In fact, more often than not, Living life with the divine flow and rowing with that flow looks something like this. I'm here, and I want to be there. Something I want to do, something I want to have, something I want to be. So, again, I decide to do this, I decide to do this, and hmm, I have an indication to read the paper today. I never look in the paper, and I see an interesting ad, and I follow that up. But when I'm at the store, I run into somebody I hadn't seen in a number of years, and they have an interesting point for me. And then the next thing I know, hey, wait a minute. Hey, where am I going? <laughs> That's where I want to go, over there. What, what am I doing over here? Why did the flow lead me here? I was doing everything right. I was following intuition. I was following guidance, wisdom of others, and that was my goal, and suddenly I'm over here, and this isn't what I planned. This isn't what I expected. This is, oh, yeah. 
this is great. <laughs> this is so much better. This is so much grander than what I had in mind. And everybody benefited from it. Thank you, God. I would have never thought of this. <laughs> you know, a lot of the things that we think we want in life are just symbols for what our heart desires. Your head has ideas like it wants a specific house. But you know what? That may just be a symbol for what the heart desires underneath that, which could be an experience of comfort, an experience of family, uh, an experience of security. What your head comes up with these ideas, these very concrete physical manifestations of what your heart wants, which is just an experience of life, an experience of life. You may think you want a specific car. Your heart just wants to make, maybe experience freedom. You may think you want a specific job and a specific amount of money. What your heart desires is simply an experience of abundance. And that's where the flow is guiding you to. So you not only have to let go of how you think you're going to arrive there, in the end, to really live your life in divine flow, you have to let go of exactly where it is you think you're going. As the Rolling Stones said, those great spiritual sages, <laughs> you can't always get what you want. <laughs> But you just might find you get what you need. Let me end the talk today by uh, telling you a, a nice little story about a time that I got what I needed. But not exactly what I wanted. Not exactly, anyway. I had written a single word in my book before people started saying, well, how are you going to publish that book? They knew I was going to go and write one and say, well, how are you going to publish it? Like, well, you know, I haven't even written it. We want to talk about that later. Much later. No, no, you got to know how to publish the book. Well, I, you know, I, I'm sure I do, but uh, I don't really want to get into that. I'm in the creative side of my brain. I don't want to get into the, you know, the, the workaday world side, the business side. I, uh, so please, don't mention that publishing thing to me until I'm, you know, done with the book. It didn't matter. Whenever I mention somebody, I'm working on a book, or now I'm halfway through the first chapter, how are you going to get it published? How are you going to get it published? Here's some information on publishing. i got stacks of all this stuff. Here's what you got to do. Here's just how it works. It's, like, this is such a downer. Look, number one, I think I know how the publishing thing works. I think it works like this. You get an agent, they shop it around, you get 10,000 rejections, and then you give up and you don't publish your book at all. <laughs> That's how publishing works. And if, I, if, I, if I'm thinking of that, I don't think I'll complete my book or even write it. I'll just give up. So I, let's not go there. Still, people would not give up on this idea. Finally, my own uh, girlfriend here, Carol, one day said, Steve, have you ever thought about going to the adult education center in Dallas called Fun Ed and taking the class on publishing? Okay, I had two reactions to that suggestion. One is, not you two, you know I don't want to talk about this. Second reaction was, did you notice the name of the place? It's Fun Ed, Fun Ed. You know, it's, it's basket weaving or finger painting or ceramic making, I don't know what it is, but they're not gonna have classes on publishing, so no. I'm not going to find Ed, thank you very much. <laughs> a few days later, I'm driving down the road, and there's a, a billboard on the side of the highway. And you know what that billboard said? <laughs> Go to Fun Ed. <laughs> www.funed.com. You know what? I ignored that, too. I'm not going to Fun Ed. <laughs> a few more days go by. I'm at lunch with 10 people from my adult Sunday school class. Noisy restaurant. I could hardly hear the person across from me speaking, let alone someone down the table. But I did hear something down the table. Three or four chairs down, I heard this one voice going, oh, 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 fun Ed. <laughs> fun Ed. <laughs> okay. Hey, I think something important is happening. <laughs> and I went down to this person. I said, hey, Larry, I heard you mentioning Fun Ed. You know, what's the deal? He said, well, I just signed up to take a class at Fun Ed. I said, really, what fun thing are you going to do? Finger painting or, you know, ceramic making or what? He said, no. I'm going to take a class called How to Publish a Nonfiction Book. <laughs> he could have said fiction book and I would have ignored it. How to Publish a Nonfiction Book. I could not believe that coincidence. But well, I could believe it and did. Obviously, this was the flow, and obviously the flow had been trying to communicate with me all along. So I did go to Fun Ed. I took the class on how to publish a nonfiction book. And not only did I come away from that class with the, the enthusiasm and the knowledge and the confidence that I could do it, I actually ended up meeting the person who became the publisher of my book. And we were able to arrange the whole deal before I was halfway through with that book. So 
I, I, I was able to write with, with complete freedom, knowing how it was going to be, and never having given another thought. And you know I would have. Those people were saying you need to know how to publish it. I don't know if they were wrong, but I would have been worrying about that the whole time in the back of my mind. You know, what are you doing, Taylor? How, how are you going to get this done? This isn't going to happen. This isn't going to work. It would have been a real drag. But as it was, it was a blessing. So it seems kind of simple, doesn't it? There was something, somewhere I wanted to go, and the flow told me exactly where to row. But you noticed, it took three times for the flow to get through to me. Three times. Oh yeah, and I'm the expert on the flow. <laughs> I'm going to write a book about how to row. <laughs> and what was I doing? Blocking, blocking, blocking. You know, all the ways that we block and restrict our experience of the divine flow is what I'll be talking about at the seminar this afternoon. But for now, let me just leave you with one thought. If you want to live a life that is more fulfilling, if you want to live a life that is more joyful, and if you want to live a life that on top of that is remarkably effortless, my suggestion for you today is to follow the words on that second sign I saw so many years ago and not the first one. Instead of trying to make it happen, let it happen. Let go and let God do for you what only God can do.